Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome to the Keys to College Admissions and Scholarships. I'm Catherine O'Brien and um, I'm excited about our meeting tonight. I have a lot of really good information for you and some good opportunities too. So um, we're going to talk about the things that keep us up at night and what we can do about it, how to make things better in our worlds with our teenagers in their college. There's a little bit about me. Um, I'm a college planning specialist, Catholic style, because I'm Catholic and it's, I approach every person as a unique individual and work with them that way. I've written a book, I speak. I've been a professional college planner since 2004. I'm based in um, San Diego, but I work with families really across the world. I have clients from Germany to Australia at this point. Um, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about my story because it's it's a, a common one and it's one a lot of us fall into and it, it shows some of the problems that that come up and some of the things we just don't know that we don't know I'm a shy town girl I'm from Chicago and you know so yes I root for the White Sox even though they lose a lot and um, I like hockey that's the Blackhawks I'm South Side Irish which uh, is a Chicago term because there's a lot of us from the South Side and my dad worked at Jewel Foods he was a grocery store manager two kids um, you know, pretty typical Southside Irish family from Chicago. And um, I loved school. It was interesting. Um, they told me what was expected and, and the outcomes. You, know, you do this, you get that grade. You do this, you get that opportunity. Um, and I really liked that clarity and that predictability. For me, that was a very comfortable environment. And I was rewarded. I got a lot of really good grades. Um, but I also got different and more interesting classes, and most importantly, my parents' praise. That was of huge import to me. So that was kind of my world growing up. But like everyone else, I had absolutely no idea what to do after college, after high school, not a clue. And my parents worked hard. They saved for the future. They didn't know anything about finding a good college for me. And I was a kid. I didn't know anything. I was 17 when I graduated high school because I was born Thanksgiving, so I was right, the youngest in my class. And they had no idea how to help me sort anything out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, I applied to a few schools. I applied to Harvard and Yale. I applied to Cornell, and I applied to Northwestern because my mom wanted me to apply to these schools because she liked prestige. So my mom was a bumper sticker mom, and that's what she was looking for, was the bragging rights. I didn't know any better. I just did what mom told me. So all of this was going to sound really good. Well, happily for me, Harvard said no, and Yale said no. And my parents said, well, Cornell is far away. It's in New York, and Northwestern's local. So no Cornell. So off I went to Northwestern. I was a chem major in the beginning. Why? Because my mom had a chemistry degree, and I was good at math and science, so I was a chem major. Does that anything about me and what I was good at or what I wanted to do? Not really. Um, so I got a couple of big mistakes going on. I'm at a campus just because, and I'm in a major just because. I'm really lost. I have no idea. And I'm really young. I don't know much of anything. During my second term at school, I met with a chemistry prof in my honors organic chemistry class, and we had a great conversation, and he just said, you don't have the gift of chemistry, dear. I said, what's that? Uh, and he helped me find a new major. So I moved to the engineering school, and I did engineering. <laughs> it was pretty um, crazy. I really had no idea what to do. And this mistake is another one of not having any guidance at all and I'm really floundering around and it's really 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 common and it's it's a big contributing factor to the the um, fact that right now the average time to get a bachelor's degree in this country is six years and this sort of floundering around that I did is very common 
So I did, um, I, I went a lot to the, the Shield Center. It was across the street from Tech. And, and I spent a lot of time and we built snowmen and we danced around in the back field when this, the first snows came and all the people from Hawaii thought we were nuts and that was kind of fun. And we had cookies and fellowship and we did lots of things. And it was kind of telling because I didn't have any friends in the industrial engineering department. All of my friends were from Shiel. And I went on retreat about six weeks before graduation, the Easter retreat. And, and I was 21, I was about to graduate from college, and so I'm really wondering what I should do with myself. And I realized that I really didn't want to do engineering. So um, fearing this, <laughs> my dad was going to blow a stack, I, I, I went ahead and I, I graduated with my degree. But I had stopped looking for work. Um, I, I didn't want to be an engineer. So I'm... <laughs> changing my major effectively six weeks before graduation and finishing just because. Um, not, not good at all. Um, so coming out, <laughs> graduating with a degree I didn't want um, with student debt and my parents had debt and yeah, I did finish. <laughs> and, and I kept working at the grocery store and, and then I got a job as a, as a commercial teller, continually to flounder around, continually to not have an idea of what I wanted to do. And starting, but starting to develop it, starting to find some people to talk to and, and get an idea. And so a couple years later, I went to graduate school. And I spent the first term doing a lot of prerequisites because I'd shifted to theology from engineering. And I had to relearn how to write papers. And, and I just loved it. it. It was a blast. And, um, but it was tough. My parents were very strong in their opinion, and they didn't even come visit me. They didn't come to graduation. They just never got on board with me doing theology at all. Years later, I found myself at homeschool park days with my kids and my friends. And a lot of people would ask me, because a number of the ladies that I knew hadn't gone to college at all, and so they would ask me, how do, I, how do admissions work? How does all this stuff work? knowing that I'd gone to graduate school, so I'd gone through admissions a couple of times. Um, and after all of that questioning and sorting and some things happened in my family, in 2004, my practice was born. And I immediately met students who, like me, weren't sure what they wanted to do. They had no idea how to pick schools, and their parents, who were losing sleep over how to pay for it all, and were kind of afraid that anyone would find out this cartoon kind of sums it up really well. Uh, here's Daryl from Baby Blues just up, stressing about all of the costs, the college fund and life insurance and retirement and the mortgage and the credit cards. And you can just see him screaming, you know, and Wanda's like, is something up? Because you know, she's in a different place right now. Not that we women don't worry about these things. We do, but this was his turn. But the college fund kind of tipped him over because you think you're moving along and you're saving for, for retirement and then you start to realize, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How do we get the kids through school? And so I responded to all of this by starting the practice in 2004, like I said. I was pregnant with, with my sixth child um, when I started this. A few years later, working with a lot of families that made enough money to not be eligible for aid, but not enough money to pay for school. Um, I did some more training and became a certified college planning specialist. Um, last year, came out with my first book on college planning, um, which is really a parent's guide for sorting out what kind of planners there are and how to find them and, and who can do what for you. Um, I also have developed programs, obviously, working with students over the last 11 years, and that's what we're here to talk about. But I wanted to share my story because hopefully you identified with some of the, the places of being lost and not knowing what to do and where to turn and having any resources. And, and the fact that my parents and I sunk a lot of time and effort and money into a Northwestern education that I ultimately didn't want. That's not the outcome that we want for our kids. So let's talk about the things that, through my professional training, my experience over these 11 years of working with students, um, the keys, the, the key things for college admissions and scholarship success. Um, I just, last night at a meeting of seniors, met with one of my clients who just the day before had gotten yet one more scholarship. So now my average is over 250,000 for this group of seniors um, each on, in scholarships. 
So I have learned some things that work. And those are merit scholarships. I don't count the need based in when I calculate those things. So let's take a look at these, these keys. And um, the first one I want to talk about is the keys, to, the keys to student prep. Okay, because we can have all the money in the world, but if our student isn't ready, we're not going anywhere. Okay, the first one is to let's address this finishing in six thing. Okay, the, the number one identified problem is that the kids don't have a goal. They're going to college and they have no idea why they're there. So we've got 41% of our college students graduating in four years or fewer. We have 48%, almost half, are graduating in more than six years. The average is six. If we have goals, it's going to have a lot of effects. So that's the first thing to start with. Why are we going to college? What's our purpose? And that's a question the student needs help answering. It's not really a question. The parent has a goal for their child, but it's really the student that needs to come up with the answer because it's going to be different than mom and dad's answer. And those of us with multiple kids, we're going to have different answers for each child. The next thing, admissions really wants to see impressive academics. They want to see challenge. They want to know that you took tough classes in the fields that you're interested in, the fields you're good in, at, in every field if you can manage it, and you have excellent grades. So if they see that you went to a school that has a lot of AP classes and things, and IB and other things offered, and you haven't done anything, that's going to count against you. Okay? They are going to look at you in your milieu, um, but your top tier schools, frankly, are um, it's very much harder if you're in a situation where you don't have access to some of the more rigorous curricula because the, the competition is pretty steep. Um, that is a consideration we all need to look at. Um, the third thing for students, they need to really do well on those tests. They just must. A lot of the scholarships are tied right to the test scores. The PSAT is completely been overhauled and redesigned. Um, the sample is out, and this group of sophomores today will be juniors in the fall and taking that, and that'll be the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. And that can mean $2,000 a year, or it can mean a full ride. I have a, a student this year who has a full academic ride as a National Merit Finalist. So it does happen, and it's um, an interesting one because you're eligible for it, and you do things, and depending on the different universities, they all have different opportunities for National Merit Scholars. Um, and then ACT, 21 is average, 36 is a perfect score. The SAT, the average is about 500 across the board, and it's being redesigned starting in March 2016. So our sophomores this year really need to be thinking about when they're taking tests next year, because if they want to be the guinea pigs in 2016, March with the new one, or if they want to get it in January with the one we all know now, and the scoring is going to be different, and a lot of things are going to be changed. There's going to be whole seminars on the new SAT. And then for those of us who don't test, because some people just don't, there are um, over 800 test optional colleges and universities right now. They will use alternative methods, uh, mostly essays, um, to evaluate their applicants. And a lot of them will accept scores, and the students will um, submit them. So we do need to pay attention. We have to do our research. Um, a little bit more about the test. The SAT, the math goes through Algebra 2. There's a writing section. The ACT, let's skip over to that. The perfect score is a 36. There's a science section. It also includes trig and pre-calculus. It's more basic grammar. The writing section is optional, but don't do it. Do the optional. Yes, you must do it. Just do it. And it's starting to be available on computer, and that's going to shift more and more that way. Um, the SAT will be following the GRE, the graduate record exam for um, some master's students and, and a lot of most doctoral students is already on the computer. So expect that that's going to happen. Um, the smarter balance tests are also on the computer. So we're, we're seeing computerized testing um, come forward in a very strong way. Um, and then the SAT subjects tests, some schools require them for admissions. There's 20 different ones available. Um, some require as many as three, so you'll need to check with admissions. But just some basic information. And test prep is not optional. The competition is just too steep. These scores are too important, both for admissions and for scholarships. Okay. And, and really, although it's not fun, it is a good exercise for students to go through, even if they're going to do test optional, 
because they have to learn how to handle a rigorous exam, an extensive exam, it's an uncomfortable situation. Because they might be doing oral comps, oral comprehensive exams, even for undergraduate degrees. Some places require that. Um, some are writing thesis papers for undergraduate degrees, certainly for master's degrees. So they're going to be in situations, and they're going to give presentations at work, and other things are going to be tested, and professional engineering exams, et cetera, et cetera. So um, anyway, they need to be able to handle this, and they need to prepare. The most effective is pra practice tests, and then honing their skills is second. You can do that with tutors, group classes, live study. I really like ePrep, um, and I have some special offers for you later on there, things I, I can offer a discount on all of their courses. It's online tutorials. Um, key to the test. You take practice tests, they um, walk you through tutorials based on your weaknesses from the practice tests. And depending on which course you take, you have more tests um, and you can do different timelines. And um, it's been a very excellent way to prepare and very flexible with kids' schedules. <clears throat> okay, another one for students. Stand out in your field of interest. One of the things that we struggle with as people we want to fit in. We want to know that other people are like us. And it's very, very difficult in high school because you have this mishmash of students. And the person next to you is a future engineer, and the one over from that is a future chef, and the one behind that is going to be a nurse, and the one behind that is going to drive the trash truck, and the one behind that is going to you know, do fine woodwork or whatever. And they're all in the same class, and you're all trying to feel OK. Or you're homeschooling and you're on your own and you have no idea what anybody else is doing. You know what your parents do and maybe some siblings and that's about it. Um, so how do we do this? Because it's very important that we do this. There's online classes. Um, we have 5 million students in 2012 taking online classes. We have MOOCs, which are massive online open courses which some give a certificate for completion, some you can get credit for, some you just take, and you just increase your knowledge base, which is going to be reflected in everything else. Um, you're demonstrating your interest. There's internships. There are specialized and selective summer camps. A summer camp that anybody can show up at is great to do a, a check at a looky loo or looking it out, exploring it. But if you want to impress the admissions people, you want to be in things that are more selective. Research teams, job shadowing, um, summer internships with various ways of doing that. There are national tests and competitions in different fields. Some of that will be related to what's going on at school, some of that will not. So go see what's available in your field of interest. Demonstrate that you have a strength in a certain area because that's what you love. And yes, you're going to explore different things because you're a teenager and they don't know. That's fine. That's fine. But as they develop that interest, they need to go demonstrate that. They also need to develop life skills. This, this quotation from the president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities is very, very important. So I put it out here verbatim. Three out of four students who get to college come lacking in foundation and strong skills that a good college education requires. Some of our kids are washing out on campus because they don't know how to handle their time. They don't know how to handle their relationships. They don't know how to handle their emotions, their money. They have no clue how to function. Um, some kids don't, don't know how to do their laundry. There's, it's their first time where they're really having to be independent, and we need to get them there. We need to give them the opportunities to get there. They've got to have those life skills because we don't want somebody who's very good academically coming home because they couldn't figure out just how to survive on their own. They just didn't have any practice. So have them practice this stuff at home, please. Um, and then don't take the minimum college credit hours. Some schools are excellent at having um, college counselors help the kids make a four-year plan and work things through. And then there's an awful lot of schools that just don't really do that, and the kids can sign up for whatever they want. Actually, in both cases, regardless of what they counsel you, you can sign up for whatever you want. And some kids will sign up for 12 credit hours because that's the minimum required to be considered a full-time student. They don't have to pay their loans back. Well, that's not enough to get you through in time to finish in four years. So they need to really be looking at what they need to be doing to get done. Again, keeping the goal in mind. Get a job. <laughs> the, the studies all show that kids, with, kids who are working at college do better. They're forced to use their time better. 
um, until, and that it's not cited as a problem with graduating on time until they're working more than 30 hours a week. It's those kids that are trying to hold on full-time jobs and go to college full-time that are, are taking extra time. And that's very understandable, totally understandable. But if they're working 15, 20 hours a week, it's, it'll be a challenge for them, but they can absolutely do it. And they need to develop some perseverance and some grit, the ability to overcome obstacles. So if we parents are doing everything for our kids, they're not getting the skills that they need in order to be successful on campus because things are going to happen. Relationships are going to go south. Interesting events are going to happen. Concerts are going to happen and distractions from doing their schoolwork. Overtime opportunities at work. Um, just wanting to sleep in, overeat, you know, hang out, go away with friends for the weekend, all kinds of things. Bad grade, not understanding a teacher and getting a really lousy you know, term paper grade or test score or something, and they have to be able to persevere through that and have the grit and the courage to overcome those obstacles. That's essential. And that is something that um, as I work with students around the country, I'm seeing as a, as a strong, as a great weakness that kids just, they're not having the opportunity to fail. They're, everything is, is sugar coated. I've even had high school students well, the parents didn't want to let them or wouldn't let them walk three blocks from the high school to the public library because it, it, they just had to be driven there. And I'm looking at them going, well, why not? It's a safe area. It's the middle of the afternoon on a major, you know, a major road, not a highway or anything. And um, how is your child ever going to learn how to get around by themselves if they're driven everywhere? Does your child know how to get on a bus and go someplace? And, and some kids are, are pretty resilient and they, they'll get around. The first time I was ever on the L, the train in Chicago, was when I was at school. But I had done a bunch of things. I'd had a job and I'd driven myself places and I dealt with a lot of things before that. So make sure your kids have those opportunities because they need them. Okay, let's move on to some of the keys for lowering costs. You see all of these, there's so much to them, we could go on and on and on, um, but I want to respect everyone's time. First, college credit by testing is huge. You know, as it says, keep calm and get a five on the AP exam. Do well on the IB, the International Baccalaureates, the CLEP exam. CLEP is um, like the AP. They're also offered by the College Board. Um, AP exams, there are AP courses you can take either online, if you're homeschooling, for example, there's an online opportunities for that. Um, and then there are plenty of classrooms that, and the College Board certifies a class as an AP class. And so they all have to follow certain rules. And then you can take a test. Depending on how you score on the test, you get some college credit. International Baccalaureate works the same way. CLEP are um, college level exams, and you can take them whenever you want. And there's as many subjects for that as there are the AP. And there, it's also by the College Board. So just go Google it and find it and do well on those. Um, you know, $80 for a, a CLEP is a lot cheaper to earn th three or four credits. Okay, and there are 2,900 colleges and universities that accept it. And as I said, that's offered by the College Board. And it's offered across the country in a no numerous settings. No special courses. Another major one is dual enrollment, taking college classes while in high school. This is helpful on a lot of fronts. The kids really figure out what college expects from them. Um, for some of our kids, it's a great opportunity for them to take the advanced courses. Um, and they, maybe they're not offered somewhere else. But additionally, they're going to get college credit. They're going to have two transcripts. So they're going to apply as a freshman and have a college transcript. And depending on the university, because every university has its own rules, but many of them will accept those credits, okay? And so that's an important thing to do on a lot of fronts. And then while they're in college, taking courses during the summer, so they come home for the summer, maybe they're taking a class or two at the junior college while they're working over the summer, and they're earning more credits. You'll see why this is, it all adds up soon. And then I wanted to address the community colleges because I always get asked this question. Should we do the community college and transfer? And I like to deal with data. So the data is that 15% of the degree-seeking students on community college campuses have a bachelor's degree within six years. That's 15%. I 
That's not very many. 85% do not yet have a bachelor's degree six years later. 80% say they want to transfer, but only 20% actually transfer within five years. So we're giving them plenty of time if they switch or they need to repeat a course or something. So within five years, you get 20% of the kids who say they want a degree are actually transferring. That's not very many. And then um, you will find that 66% of those who transferred within six years actually have a bachelor's degree. Okay, which is why I have the little funny little fraction thing because you know you're trying to do 66% of 20% or <laughs> two thirds of one fifth. It ends up with a really small piece of pie. So we have the 15%. Very few of these kids who are going to do that route are going to be successful. Can it be done? Absolutely. But those students need to be even more focused and more assertive than the ones at the four-year universities. There's less support for them at the community college than there is at the four-year to get done. And the numbers are against them. And some places, the community colleges are very high caliber. Other places, they're not so good. So you need to do your homework. Some places, there are um, programs between the community colleges and the universities in the state um, to accept. So if you want to go to this particular state university, you need to go to one of these particular community colleges because there's a preferential acceptance rate of transfer students. So you'll need to do a little homework here. You need to actually do a lot of homework. But I like to give the reality that 15% are going to have a bachelor's within six years. Parents tend to think it's two years in the community college, two years in the college, and they're done, and I saved a boatload of money. No. Most, for most of these kids, they, they're not going to graduate. Statistics have been showing, and it's been consistent for years, most of the kids going to community college are not going to end up with a bachelor's degree. So you know your student, so you know what to do. Um, they need to find the right fit, okay? You want to avoid transferring as much as possible because when you transfer, even my risky transfer, which I got away with at Northwestern from one college, the College of Arts and Sciences, into the Technological Institute, worked because I was going from a hard science to engineering. My math skills were excellent, so I was already there, and it was freshman year. So they have trimesters there, so it's third trimester tr freshman year is when I switched. And much later, forget about it, with, especially with engineering. It's pretty unforgiving. But if I'd gone from engineering into the arts or something, well, all those math and science classes, how many electives can they fill up? There's a lot of other humanities classes you're not taking. So you don't want to transfer. And then you go university to one to university two, a lot more gets lost in the translation because every university has their own rules about what they will accept. And, and they can change year to year and even course to course or professor to professor. So you may have an intro to econ course with professor one and somebody else has intro to econ with professor two and the university will accept one or the other because in the university setting, the professors really design the courses and some will have a reputation for not having good quality courses. So the university, the receiving university, the one you're transferring to has got a lot of say in what they accept. So how do you avoid it? We have to have right fit for the student, okay? We're looking for the right programs, the right majors and alternate majors, if we're not sure, or even just some wiggle room because we are dealing with teenagers. They're going to adjust a little bit. The right atmosphere. There are all kinds of things that go on on a college campus. For some kids, some of those are problematic and others are not, and so they need to be in the right atmosphere. Um, the right learning styles and opportunities for your student and the right career connections on the, on the back end. What, what's their placement like? Um, and then for the budget, financial aid and scholarships, of course. What's the net cost going to be so that you don't end up in a situation where we've gone for two years, honey, and we're out of money? <laughs> or your sister's starting, now we really can't do both. Um, so we need to have that right fit and do that research at the beginning. Okay, lots of words on this page. Tuition reduction programs exist. And um, most of them are geographical and so I've listed all the states for all of these. There's a handful of states that are not listed because they don't participate um, or they'll have little partial things. They don't have big programs. But these are regional um, tuition reduction programs so that residents in one state in the region going to colleges and universities that are participating in the program in those other states, typically they'll get um, one and a half times in-state tuition. And that can save you as much as 10000 or more a year on just on tuition. 
So you'll absolutely want to find your geographical rigid region and note down the name of your undergraduate exchange or common market program so that you can go do the research later to see what makes sense in your area. Okay, because that's that can be you can be writing yourself, a, you know, a, a twenty to sixty thousand dollar scholarship just by applying properly through these programs. Okay, um, for example, I had a student I worked with, and she was applying out of state to a state that was in, in, in her case, it was California student applying to an Arizona school there that's in the Western undergraduate exchange, and she was going to apply a certain way. And so that was not going to be part of the WUI program because it can be by major and college and all kinds of special distinctions of what qualifies for the program and what doesn't. And so she was going to, um, the way she filled out her application was going to be straight out of state, which was 39 grand. And she was in a, a double major that was going to take five years. And so she was looking at paying 195000 for a degree. Happily, she consulted me. I reviewed things and said, wait, well, what, I changed it. Kept her two majors, but changed the way. Um, to access those majors, and so it fell into the WUI program, which saved her over $9,000 each year and brought the cost of um, the degree down $46,000 just by knowing how to use the program and applying it correctly. Okay, so that was a $46,000 savings for them that they paid me a consulting fee for, which I can tell you was a lot less than $46,000. Sometimes people tell me I should charge by the percentage off, but nobody would ever pay me that much money. So I don't. Um, another one is, another thing to look at is to leverage the need-based aid. I give whole workshops on need-based aid, so I'm not gonna be able to get into that tonight. Um, but I do wanna point out the difference. So I have two competitive schools. They're rival schools, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign downstate and Northwestern in Evanston, just north of Chicago. The cost of attendance in-state um, at U of I is 29 and a half, almost 30. So the family, my sample family here with the EFC of 5,000, that's the family contribution. They need from the financial aid office, you know, God, the mailbox, somehow they need another $24,600 to make this work. Now, historically, U of I meets uh, two-thirds of need. They don't meet 100% of what families need. They, on average, meet two-thirds of it. And they meet, two, meet that with 67% gift aid. And then self-help, which is work study and loans, is typically a third of the package. And so the out-of-pocket cost is going to be 13353 which is the cost of attendance minus the financial aid or you can look at it as the EFC plus the percent of need they didn't meet. Either way, it's the same number. Okay, the true cost when you add back in the loans, it's 18684 okay? Then we'll look at Northwestern, which is horrendously expensive. We all know that it's one of those schools. It's a nice school, but they're really expensive. Same family, so they need $58,000. And a lot of people just give up right there. So they're way too expensive. We're not even putting them on your list, honey. But they're a 100% need met school and they meet most of it with gift aid. So your out-of-pocket cost is your EFC, and your true cost, adding the loans back in, is a lot less than the true cost at University of Illinois. These are rival schools. They're very, both very good in, in a number of areas. They're not far away from each other either, geographically, but Northwestern's cheaper than University of Illinois, and this is true until the, the family's contribution is more than the cost of attendance at University of Illinois. So you want to do some due diligence on the need-based portion of this as we're planning for saving. So not a scholarship thing strictly, but definitely wanted to address that because it's important. Um, one last thing about lowering costs, please be aware of tax credits and um, de tax deductions that you can take. The deductions are on the front page of the 1040, so it lowers your adjusted gross income, which is the key number for figuring out financial aid. Um, contribution for the next year, but the um, credits often end up being a net gain. So you need to look at which of these makes sense. Talk to your tax preparer about the tax, the education tax credits and the education um, tax deductions. You can't use them all at the same time. Of course, there's limitations on all of that. And some are by return and some are by student. So you want to pay attention because we have multiple returns in play when we have kids in college. Another one is special programs. There are five-year bachelor master's programs, combined programs, or um, bachelor things like um, 
doctor of uh, physical therapy that are combined programs and they tend to shave a year off sometimes two usually just one a year off of the whole process so that can be a way to lower costs usually you have to have a, an exceptionally good student academically in order to do that but if you have one you may as well check out all your options another thing is cooperative education um, it's there are programs that schools will run some have paid internships called that they call them and some uh, call it co-op and co-op programs mean usually make a four-year degree into a five-year degree because they're adding a year of work in while the student is a student so that one semester junior soft, late sophomore year or junior year and then one semester after that that semester's course for the university will be working in the industry for their with their major and the student gets paid for that okay which is why it's here in lowering costs because although it's extending the time to degree it's because they're getting job experience in their field and they're getting paid for it okay so the student's going to be able to help out a lot more because they're going to get paid you know half to two-thirds of starting salary which in these fields is pretty good starting salary these days is forty-five thousand, so average over all fields um, so they can definitely be helping so one example if we can shave off just one semester with taking community college classes dual enrollment ap's clap exams ib's we can just take one semester off of college time we're going to save about twenty thousand dollars okay because the average is forty thousand between public and private schools and they're going to work that six months because they're graduating early so they're going to gain and at the average starting salary for the class of 2014 half of that is 22,736. so these keys to lowering costs this potentially right here is almost forty three thousand dollars okay because sometimes when i don't break this out people are going well that's not really going to make much difference like actually add it all up and this is only one scenario there are others in the examples that i gave you that you could put together that might be more appropriate for your family pencil it out you will find that there's a lot of money there okay so let's talk to the keys is talk about the keys to scholarships because that's what is always what gets everybody excited the notion of, of free money is always uh, exciting always always and all those Benjamins wouldn't we all want a lot of those guys coming to our house of course so I'm gonna go back to the very first thing I said about students what's their interest what's their goal develop that give the schools a reason to give you scholarships it could be leadership my Eagle Scout son got sixty thousand dollars in a legal in a leadership scholarship from his top choice school they didn't do an Eagle Scout scholarship and the National Association of Eagle Scouts although it's a select group of individuals across the country every year there's a lot of Eagle Scouts and there's only, they're going for a handful of scholarships he couldn't get that but he got leadership and Eagle Scout of course is not the only way to do it a special skill or interest what are they into are they doing forensic speech and debate what what is it that's special about them okay because you will find money for that the student's goal is going to be key here. Okay, there are pre-law things and different things depending on what they're wanting to work on. Teach kids who know they want to teach and they want to teach poor kids because they really have a heart for doing that. Okay, there's money for that. There's money for a lot of things. And then special groups. Um, speech and debate is one that I like a lot that a lot of people don't think about um, as having scholarship money, but there's some serious money. There's some serious money in some other groups as well of various kinds. And then, of course, athletics. People are aware of that. But the NCAA and the NAIA have a lot of rules and things. And so, um, you know, 1% of high school athletes gets get some athletic scholarship money. It's just a, a, we hear about it when it happens. So give them a reason. So this whole development of the student and what they want to do and who they are and what kind of fields they go in flow into getting money. Every year it flows into going money for my students. And even their... They have differing interests and they're developing. It still happens. This is um, a chart from the College Board. We gets updated every year of all the sources of financial aid. And I want to bring your attention in that on the left-hand side, there's a 19%, it's like peach-colored wedge there. 19% of all the student aid is institutional grants. 
When I ask in live seminars, what are institutional grants, most people have no idea. And institutional grants are money from the colleges themselves. Okay, I'm going to go back to this one. There's this little, where is it? On the top there, the 6% um, blueberry color, private and employer grants. What that is, is uh, employer um, reimbursements. A lot of employers have that for their to get their employees to do better, to boot the, to develop management skills and different things that will improve their performance at work. And it also includes about 1.4% of that is private scholarships. Okay. They dollar for dollar reduce financial aid. They have all sorts of deadlines. They have all sorts of extra requirements. And it's 1% of the money. Okay. It's an, and it, and when you put the, the dollars together and do the do the math, it's 1% of the scholarship money as well. So this is where, this is a huge key right here. 99% of the scholarship money has come from the colleges themselves. So that's where you need to go fishing. Okay. That sign is supposed to say for quality education plan ahead. And the person who made the sign obviously didn't plan ahead very well. But that's huge. If you want big scholarship dollars, as you can see, if you're thinking about it, developing your students' skills and area of expertise or interest or um, special qualities, it's going to take time. There's also a lot of research involved to find the scholarships and the schools with the scholarships that correlate. And you need to apply early and often, I like to say. Um, what are all the deadlines? And be there early. And know all of the deadlines so you're applying often. You're not just applying to one thing. Um, and of course, follow the rules, big time. And you you watch kids every year walk away from scholarship money because they they turn it in a day late, or they missed a part of the form or something, and you just wince. Ah, that was thirty grand, um, you know, or three grand or whatever it is. It happens. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at kind of crafting what I call crafting the master key of putting it all together. Really, it requires a master, master craftsman to do that. Somebody who's trained, experienced, highly skilled, who has high integrity, because we're dealing with young people here and a lot of hopes and dreams. Um, my credentials, if you missed them earlier, but I don't, really don't want to dwell on it. I've been doing this since 2004. Um, the results, I think, speak for themselves. Um, two years ago, it was just over $100,000 each on average in merit scholarships. Last year, it was $133,000 each on average. And I think both of those are less than what was real because this year I've really stayed on my seniors more. And I actually talked to a senior who gotten a scholarship. I talked to her yesterday. She'd gotten a scholarship the day before, but she'd already committed to her college. So she threw it away. I made her mom dig in the trash. Like, How much was that for? <laughs> she didn't even know. So they don't always report the total, but this year um, kids have reported more and it's, over $250,000 each on average in scholarships. So using these tools works. Whoops, where am I going? There are several ways that we can do this that I have available. One is consulting, one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, and the best way, shoot, I will email everybody. I have links. I'm just realizing that the, the thing is broken, so I can't put the links up right now. Um, the best way is to sign up for a college readiness review consultation. Um, I, after the webinar, I will be going and changing that. So I will email, I'll get your list of everyone who's here and I will email you the link for this as well as the links for the other things I have to, to, so you can get the lower rate, um, for the consultation. But we'll meet and we'll talk to the student about their readiness, their thoughts, their their goals, why they're thinking what they're thinking, you know, because some kids just have dreams that don't make any sense and other kids are, have very well thought out plans. Look at the financial aid side, all of that, um, and, and see if working one-on-one -on -one is an appropriate thing to do. Then I also have taken the very same principles that I work with my one-on-one -on -one students and come up with those great results, and I've created online courses. Um, and I have, for freshmen and sophomores, we're very focused on career and college search, resume creation, student development, getting them really in the mindset, creating the habit that they need, and starting to do the research. Because once they start finding out that, gee, I really want to do this, everything changes for them. And, and 
even though they're continuing to explore and refine that thought, and, and sometimes we'll change wholesale from this thought to that thought, just that whole process, it shifts them. Everything means something. It's not homework for the sake of homework anymore. It just really, really changes the game for them. Junior year, we're very focused on college search and all the rest of it. Actually, I think I have, yeah. The junior year, we do resume creation again and uh, refinement because it changes career selection. We're refining that. College selection, we're narrowing our list that we started freshman and sophomore year. How to do campus visits with a purpose. I actually have a campus visit guide that I provide. Um, estimating net costs at possible schools so we can look beforehand how much do we expect this to cost us, our particular family, for this school. So we know if it makes sense. Um, and then finalizing the list. Pre-writing application essays. There's things to do early on while you're researching the school that make that a lot easier. Getting your recommendations. And then, of course, dealing with testing, your AP, IB, ACT, SAT, all of that, so SAT subject tests. That's all in the junior prep course. In the senior prep course, we're going to totally finalize that list of schools, create the application checklist. And this is the same. I do the same thing with my consulting students as I walk through in the course. It's the same thing. Creating the application and scholarship strategies, track the applications, again, get recommendations. And sometimes we're helping the recommenders write them because they don't know what to say. Um, sending transcripts, test scores, keeping track of all that, trying not to go crazy. Um, I teach kids how to do interviews, um, how to write successful application essays. I, I do um, edit those for the students, <laughs> um, at least for my consulting students. I do very much that. Um, and then it's an option if I have time for my online course students. And then financial aid applications, walking you through. My consulting clients, I prepare those and file them. And for my, my course clients, I explain to you how to do that. Um, and then evaluating the offers so you can sell apples to apples because they're almost always incomplete. You wouldn't believe this little bit that the schools put on. They miss a lot. And then I have a toolkit that comes with both the courses or working with me as a consulting client with a timeline of what to do when. So you have an overview. You know where we're going. Um, the personal achievement resume creation. It's different than a business resume. This is something specifically for college admissions. It also boosts self-esteem. The campus visit guide, as I mentioned before, how to set one up, what, who to talk to, what to ask them, how to record it, keep track of it, all of that stuff. Um, ACT and SAT essay guide, it's different than other things. You're writing a very intense essay in 20, 25 minutes. So I have a guide of how to do that and walk them through timing and examples and all of that. And then college selection and how to sort it out and the different factors to take into account. And it, that's a customized process, but I show you how to do it. So all of that comes with the courses. Um, then I have some bundles, I have some special offers that I have put together for you people tonight and I'm very excited about. Um, and they include the premium e-prep courses for ACT or SAT. I have two bundles, an ACT bundle and an SAT course bundle. Um, and these are e-prep courses, the online tutorials that I mentioned earlier that have been really, really effective. The ACT, they've got a three-point score increase guarantee. The SAT, a 250-point score gar improvement guarantee. Um, they're taking full tests and, and partial tests and going back and forth with tutorials and there's schedulers in them. There's uh, logins for the parents so that they can over, to keep overviewing, overseeing what the children are doing to make sure they're continuing to do the work. Um, and those courses go for six months, so they'll go into the fall too. So all of the value of this, this junior online course is worth $5,400. The senior online course is worth $6,600. And it has the College Prep Toolkit, which is almost $200. The ACT ePrep Premium course is $199, and the SAT is $299. So the total value of these bundles that I put together, for the ACT bundle, it's $12,400, basically, and for the SAT, it's $12,500. Am I going to charge you that much? No, I have some special deals. So my normal pricing is significantly discounted already, as you can see. The ACT course bundle would be 1,543. The SAT junior senior course bundle would be 1,622. There are payment plans, but wait, because you're on this webinar and you've invested this time, you have an idea of where we're going, you're more motivated, you've really invested in your student, I put those prices are too much. So today through May 5th, and the recording will be available, you can share it, this pricing is good for anybody through May 5th. You can get the ACT course bundle with the junior senior course and the uh, college prep toolkit and the ACT premium course for 1,346. 
and you can get the SAT course bundle with the junior and senior courses, the SAT prep and the um, college prep toolkit for 1434. The difference is the AC, the core, the EPREP course cost difference. Okay. Um, so those are both huge discounts um, and they are available. As I said, I'm having technical issues with giving you the links. I will email you as soon as I am done with this webinar, I will be emailing everybody and it'll be in your inbox how to sign up for a consultation and how, so you can discuss if you want to be in the online course or a consulting client, or we can evaluate you for being a consulting client. Or if you just want to chat about your situation, um, there's a, spe a special today only as you schedule those. It's a hundred dollars. I will send you again. I will send you that link as soon as I'm done talking here and I can get into my email. Um, and we'll set it up. And then for the consulting clients, that fee will get um, put towards the consulting fees that we determine are appropriate for you. And oh yeah, there are some of you that are going to choose to do this yourself. And you can. You're going to have many, many hours of research and effort. You're going to have, continue to keep the stress and the fear that you're not doing it right, that you're missing something that's going to go on and on and on. And you can risk having higher, higher college costs, taking longer to get there, your student having to take more loans, wiping out your retirement, even tapping your retirement is a shame for college. Uh, selling your house, I've seen families do that, to pay for school. Um, and increasing the chances that your child won't graduate at all. So I know you don't want any of those things. Um, some people are firm believers to do it yourself. Um, I do do ad hoc consulting. If I'm available, I'd be happy to work with you. And if I'm not, um, I'll refer you if I can. Um, I try not to leave you with nothing. I want to thank you for your time. And as I said, I will be emailing you in the next 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes um, with the links. I'm very sorry that I had that technical issue and could not put up the links for the course bundles, but you will have it and you can get the courses just by themselves. You can get eight, the ACT prep course by itself, the SAT prep course by itself, or the bundles. All of those are discounted at the same rate. So if you add them all together, all the discounted rates is still the same. Um, and then also the link to schedule the um, Skype consultation. So thank you very much. Um, if you have questions, really the consultation is the best place to handle that. Um, you're welcome to email me if you'd like. My email address is on the screen. Um, and if it's a limited question, I can email you back or um, I'll suggest a consultation. Um, I, I found that it's not good to get into a lot of personal matters in, in a, on a webinar, especially when it's being recorded. So for your privacy, I really didn't want to do questions today. So thank you very much for your time. And I am going to um, end now and get those emails to you. So thank you very much again and have a great day.